Hi right, everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today in AP Macroeconomics, we're going to be talking about inflation and the causes of it, and sometimes when it's unanticipated, what happens. Here we go. So a little review questions about unemployment, if you need to look back at the uh, last topic, PowerPoint, uh, YouTube. So calculation causes and impacts of unanticipated inflation. So inflation is, by definition, a rise in the general level of prices. That means it is an average. So some prices are more, some prices are less comparatively to the uh, average. Each dollar of income will buy fewer goods and services than before. So your buying power has decreased, hence real income will be a conversation. It reduces the purchasing power of the money. doesn't mean that all prices are rising. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about inflation. GDP price index uh, includes C plus I plus G plus the X, so includes everything. Okay, Consumer price index only, and that's the usual one we look at, is going to mostly only be looking at household consumption. So it doesn't talk about businesses, governments um, either. Uh, so it would still talk about personal consumption for the expect, um, net exports, but it's only on consumption. So it's approximately 300 consumer goods and services. So CPI is typically more of the urban settings. You can get rural as well. Um, and then the GDP price index or GDP deflator uh, does not include foreign purchasing, but it includes all purchasers. For our purposes, they're interchangeable. So here's how you calculate this. And we've talked about this in previous um, lectures. So the value of the market basket in a given year divided by the value of the market basket in a base year times 100 equals the price index, whichever version you're talking about. So I have an example down below. So year two CPI minus year one CPI divided by year one CPI equal times 100. So if you plug in all those numbers, you get 3.4% for 2005 and 2004. So again, you're not dividing by 100 unless you're dividing by the base year as your reference point. So just want to kind of clarify that. Now, types of inflation talks about the causes of inflation. So we're going to talk later about the aggregate supply and aggregate demand curve in class. So right now we're just going to talk about supply and the demand curve from microeconomics. So the first curve we're going to talk about is called demand pull inflation. This is caused by too much spending, meaning the demand, usually through consumption sector, is going to increase. And that's going to pull so we have this demand curve, it's increasing, so that pulls the prices up. And if this happens at the aggregate level, meaning everybody's doing it all over the place, then the average prices would have increased, and we again just declared that as inflation. So this is demand pull inflation. The alternative is cost push inflation, meaning the resource prices increases and go back to microeconomics, if the input resources increase, that decreases the ability to supply the good. And if this happens at the aggregate level, so something like energy, electricity, oil, whatever else, if that increases, then most companies would be impacted, and so the ability to supply would decrease. So as the cost of the input increases, it's going to push that price level up. We're going to come back to this quite a bit when we talk about the graph, but that right now we're just talking about the inflation levels. It's more common to have demand pull inflation. Cost push inflation is when we refer to as stagflation. So again, this is a worse scenario. It's also less likely to happen or less common, uh, but again, longer conversation on that one. So for the cost push inflation, you usually look at the per unit production cost. So the total input cost divided by the unit of output. Okay, so if these are increasing. Um, minimum wage increases. Now it costs that much more to hire the same person per hour. Well, that unit cost, the total input cost is higher because I have to pay them more per hour. Divided by the number of units, it's the same number. Well, then my budget doesn't go as far. So again, we have the cost push inflation here we can see the graph that we'll talk about later in class so nominal versus real we've talked about nominal versus real before again so nominal the num number of dollars received as wage rents interest and profits that's your income real income is a measure of, the, of how far does your nominal income go based off of inflation so just like we did real gdp that was non-gdp divided by price index in hundreds 
Here, real income is the same equation. Real income equals nominal income divided by the price index in hundreds. So again, we're reusing that information from before. So how much has real income changed? Um, so you can do it that way. Or if you're getting percentage changes, you can just do this equation. So the percentage change in real income is approximately the percentage change in your nominal income minus percent change in price level. So if you are told that your income has increased by 10% and the prices on average, hence inflation, have increased by 5%, what's the approximate change in real income? 5%, 10 minus 5. Okay, so if you're given those numbers, it's a lot easier. Now with that said, what if there's inflation, but it was unanticipated? Okay, that people didn't expect it to happen. Well, some people are going to be more affected. Okay, so there's always predictions of inflation of going to be X amount. So when is it higher than it is, or, or, or lower could happen too. Some people are hurt, some people are helped in a weird way, and some people are just kind of in a, unaffected. So who is hurt? People on fixed incomes. If your income stays at $100 per month for whatever reason, and the prices have generally increased, then your $100, your buying power, have decreased. Second group is creditors, meaning people who are lending out money, usually banks, but it could be if you're buying a bond as an individual, then you're acting as a bank. In that case, you're going to be hurt. So let's say a bank lends out $500. When they get it back, the $750 for the interest included, if there's been inflation, that $750 can not buy the same amount of goods. So the buying power of the payment back is less. Now, a much easier way to think about this is a thing called the Fisher equation, which is down below. So nominal interest, that's going to be the interest that the, cons that the borrower is going to actually pay. Nominal interest equals the real interest. Pretty much think about that as like the profit margins. Okay, they're going to, they think they need that much money in order to pay the costs and also to gain profit from doing this. This would be from the bank's perspective or the lender's perspective. And on top of that, they're going to add the expected inflation, what you might call inflation premium. So if the bank needs 3% to cover their costs, and I think inflation is going to be 2%, so all my costs are going to increase by 2%, then I should charge the customer 5%. But here's the thing. But if the actual inflation is 3%, not 2%, then how much should the bank have charged? 6%. Well, I can't change it. We'll assume a fixed interest rate. I'm charging my borrower 5%. So the lender was hurt because they did not receive enough to cover their increase in cost. They're charging 5%. They should have charged 6%. So because they did not correctly anticipate inflation, they are hurt by this. Who is unaffected flexible income receivers why because their income will be flexible okay it'll adjust to the inflation levels okay um, for instance people on social security social security is uh, uh, updated based off of the official inflation for that year who else is unaffected or in fact sometimes helped uh, borrowers. Why? For the same reason that the lenders are hurt. They, borrowers, if there's unanticipated inflation, they're paying back money with fewer real dollars. Okay, and when they borrow $500 and then pay back the $750, what they pay it back with couldn't buy the same lending practice. Okay, so in that way, they, they're unaffected. But based on the Fisher equation, they're paying back fewer or lower interest rates than they probably should have been. Okay. So that's it. Okay, quick calculations. We've covered that kind of stuff before. Some causes, that would be the uh, demand pull and cost push inflation. And then finally, unanticipated inflation. All right, until next time.